Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Chris Guthrie. I'm a professor of law and the dean of Vanderbilt Law School. And on behalf of the school, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Future of Gay Marriage Part 1, a discussion. Uh, this program is the first of two devoted to a discussion between activists on the very important topic of marriage equality. Today's event is co-sponsored by Outlaw, which is a, a law school student organization, and Gable, an office at the Divinity School for students, faculty, and staff. For making this event possible, I want to thank the law school's Hyatt Fund, uh, the Stonewall Bar Association, and the Carpenter Program in Religion, Gender, and Sexuality. Uh, I am honored to introduce our two panelists and our moderator. Uh, our first panelist is John Davidson. He is the legal director at Lambda Legal. Following his graduation from Yale Law School, John practiced at Arell and Manila in LA, served as the head of the Lesbian and Gay Rights Project of the ACLU in Southern California, and has served at Lambda Legal uh, for more than a decade and a half. Uh, at Lambda Legal, John has been counsel in many of the most significant cases involving gay, lesbian, and transgender rights, and has also been actively engaged in legislative and civic activities. Our second panelist is Reverend Susan Russell, a senior associate at All Saints Church in Pasadena. Named one of the 50 most influential voices in the Anglican Communion, uh, she has been a leader in the HRC Religion Council, Integrity USA, California Faith for Equality, and the Episcopal Diocese of Los Angeles Program Group on LGBT Ministry, among many, many others. For those of you familiar with the Myers-Briggs, she is an ENFJ, which means she shares two tendencies, that is the N and the J, with the modal law student and lawyer. Our moderator, Ellen Armour, is the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Chair in Feminist Theology, as well as the director of the Carpenter Program uh, in Religion, Gender, and Sexuality at the Vanderbilt Divinity School. She is a scholar of feminist theology, theories of sexuality, race, gender, disability, and embodiment, and contemporary continental philosophy. Ellen will start us off. Please join me in welcoming Ellen. Thanks, Chris. And uh, on behalf of the Carpenter Program in the Divinity School, I want to welcome all of you here as well and to um, express our excitement at this opportunity to walk, what is it, maybe 500 feet <laughs> across campus um, to do some joint programming. We're all very excited about it. Um, my role here is really just to tell you how this session is going to proceed. Um, we're going to allow our two guests to speak for about 20 minutes each first. Um, John will go first, followed by Susan, and then we'll move into a more informal uh, setting. I've been being called Professor Oprah, um, which I will be the host of a question and answer session. I'll start by just asking a couple of questions to get us warmed up, and uh, then it will be your turn to shine. So um, without further ado, I turn it over to John. Well, I also wanted to thank both the law school and the Divinity School and the Dean, uh, and for all the students who've helped uh, put this program together. It's great to see so many people here. I didn't know if this was like the law school side and the Divinity School side, or if it was the bride side and the bride side. Um, but uh, it's, it's exciting to be here. It's actually uh, exciting. It's particularly today is the day before uh, what's been designated for the last 13 years as Freedom to Marry Day is tomorrow, uh, come, coming on uh, the same day as Lincoln's birthday and celebrating equality, uh, and two days before Valentine's Day, of course, celebrating love. Um, and uh, so, so uh, I wish you all in advance a, a very happy uh, Freedom to Marry Day. Uh, I also wanted to let people know on the corner back there, I brought a couple of materials, um, our uh, uh, three times a year publication about Lambda Legal's work. Um, a publication that we did a number of years ago, People of Faith Speak Out, Voices for Marriage Equality, which I think students in the Divinity School might be particularly interested in. And we have a sign-up sheet for people who want to get our um, online newsletter for students, um, particularly for law students uh, who are interested in getting more detail about uh, the legal work we're doing. 
So I was going to first really try to address uh, what's going on in, in probably the most famous of marriage cases going on right now, the Perry versus Schwarzenegger case, the federal challenge to Proposition 8. But before doing that, I, I wanted to put it in context of where we are in the legal struggle to obtain marriage equality and what led up to the filing of that case. And I'm going to be talking primarily from a legal perspective, but I'm looking forward to the dialogue we're going to be having after Susan uh, speaks. Um, at the moment, same-sex couples can legally marry in the District of Columbia and in five states in the United States, Connecticut, Iowa, Massachusetts, uh, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Those are all relatively small states, but based on statistics derived from the 2005 American Community Survey, it still means that 5% of same-sex couples in the United States live in jurisdictions where they can now enter a civil marriage. In addition, at least three more states, Maryland, New Mexico, and New York, have begun to honor marriages entered in other jurisdictions, so that one can't marry in that state if you're a same-sex couple. You can marry somewhere else, and the state will treat you as married. Um, so that translates into nearly 13% of same-sex couples in the country who live in one of the nine US jurisdictions where they can be recognized under state law as married and get all of the state law rights of marriage. That's about one in eight same-sex couples in the United States. Moreover, another six states, California, Illinois, New Jersey, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington, have passed civil union or broad state-registered domestic partnership laws. And as a result, there are, or now, or once Illinois' very recently enacted law uh, goes into effect in June, there will be 15 jurisdictions home to more than one-third of the nation's same-sex couples who can or soon will be able to obtain all or virtually all of the state law rights and responsibilities of marriage. Finally, there are four more states, Connecticut, Hawaii, Maine, and Wisconsin, in addition to Maryland, which will recognize marriages from other states, that now provide a formalized status, a legal status, to same-sex couples at the state level uh, through which they can obtain some of those rights afforded to married couples. So in sum, 18 states and the District of Columbia, where in total almost 37% of the nation's same-sex couples live, now or very soon will recognize same-sex couples' relationships and either allow same-sex couples to enter legal marriages or make it possible for them to obtain all or at least some of the same rights that the state provides to those who are married. And what's most amazing about all of that is that none of it existed only a dozen years ago. So when you just think about that for a minute, a dozen years ago, the, the concept of, of same-sex couples marrying legally in the United States, it, 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 was, it was a dream, or I guess to some people a nightmare. Um, and, uh, and it's now a reality for large numbers of people in the country. Um, and getting some recognition, 37% um, uh, of the same-sex couples in this country. Um, that's a remarkable change. Um, of course, there are many parts of the country where the, where the picture is decidedly less rosy. No other civil rights movement has ever seen such rapid progress in achieving equality, but the speed at which this has happened has to some extent contributed to a tremendous backlash. Our progress has been mostly in the New England states, the northern Atlantic seaboard, a few states in the Midwest, and in the West. No state in the South or South Central regions of the country currently provide any formal state recognition to, uh, or rights to same-sex couples. 29 states, including Tennessee, now have state constitutional amendments barring civil marriage by same-sex couples. And 18 of those constitutional amendments, although not this state's, may extend further than marriage and prohibit uh, recognition of civil unions or domestic partnership or grant of rights uh, to those in such statuses. Cases uh, asking the, for the freedom to marry for same-sex couples have been lost in Arizona, Indiana, Maryland, New York, Oregon, and Washington. But I remain very hopeful and very optimistic. Throughout this country, public opinion is growing in support of marriage equality, particularly among young people, at a really amazing clip. For example, in a national poll done in April of 2008, 
of Americans opposed same-sex couples being allowed to marry, and 35% supported it. But in September of 2010, only a year and a half later, only 47% opposed civil union by same-sex, uh, a civil marriage by same-sex couples. That is less than a majority. Um, and 43% favored allowing same-sex couples the right to marry legally, which is an increase of 8% in only 17 months. So um, I believe we are winning and we will win. In my work at Lambda Legal, I've had the honor of being involved as a legal activist, an activist primarily in the courts, um, in many of the advances toward protecting the rights of same-sex couples. I worked on Lambda Legal's cases that won marriage equality in Iowa, uh, legal recognition of out-of-state marriages in New York, and civil unions in New Jersey. I was co-counsel with the ACLU and the National Center for Lesbian Rights in the case that made it possible for more than 18,000 same-sex couples to marry in California uh, in 2008 uh, before the passage of Proposition 8, and uh, the subsequent case that held that those couples remain married in California, notwithstanding Proposition 8's enactment. Uh, I also worked on front of the court briefs in gay and lesbian advocates and defenders successful marriage cases in Massachusetts and Connecticut. And I, on a legislative front, co-drafted California's registered domestic partnership law and was co-counsel in cases defending it. Uh, I'm currently assisting in our litigation seeking comprehensive legal protections in Hawaii uh, and equal health insurance benefits for lesbian and gay state employees, uh, partners in Arizona. And am I currently married? No. Uh, I'm in a long-term relationship, but as I said to one reporter who asked me, and to my mother, um, <laughs> we're fighting for the freedom to marry, not the obligation to marry. Uh, so uh, moving to the Perry versus Schwarzenegger case itself, Perry followed an extended history in California of seeking equal rights for same-sex couples and their families. Uh, this began with the adoption of the first statewide domestic partnership registry in the country in 1999 which originally only provided uh, rights for hospital visitation and certain rights in conservatorship proceedings. That was then broadened in, le in legislative session after legislative session uh, until 2003 when the legislature passed a law known as AB 205, which provided comprehensive domestic partnership rights and which went into effect in 2005. Um, that law was then challenged by um, some uh, nonprofit legal organizations affiliated with fundamentalist religious groups uh, who, who, who funded it. Um, and uh, we were successful in defeating that challenge and upholding the domestic partnership law. Um, they had argued that allowing uh, same-sex couples to have any formalized legal status uh, 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 interfered with or somehow diminished uh, marriage for different sex couples. Um, then in 2004, shortly after his election as mayor of San Francisco, Gavin Newsom, who is now California's lieutenant governor, uh, ordered the city clerk to start allowing same-sex couples to marry because he believed that the exclusion of same-sex couples from marriage was unconstitutional. Um, this set off really an explosion around the country because here for the first time, it, this was before same-sex couples could marry in Massachusetts, same-sex couples were lining up and getting marriage licenses at City Hall and getting married and it was all televised. Um, and uh, approximately 4,000 couples did get married within one month as we were in court almost every day with the right wing trying to shut it down unsuccessfully. Uh, until ultimately the California Supreme Court, in a case known as Lockyer versus San Francisco, put a halt to the marriages and ultimately held that all of those who had gotten married during that period uh, uh, were no longer married, that their marriages were void, improperly granted, because local government officials do not have the right to unilaterally refuse to follow a state law on the ground that they believe it to be unconstitutional, but rather have to wait or obtain an appellate ruling declaring it to be unconstitutional before disobeying the law. Um, in response to what seemed to be an invitation to obtain an appellate ruling, several cases were filed in state court asserting that California was violating the state's constitution by not allowing same-sex couples to marry. Uh, one was brought by Lambda Legal, the ACLU, and the National Center for Lesbian Rights, uh, and another by the city and county of San Francisco. In 2008, 
the California Supreme Court ruled in a case known as in re marriage cases uh, that denying same-sex couples the freedom to marry violated the state constitution's guarantees of liberty, equality, and privacy. Um, and uh, I, I, one of the things I always thought was significant is it's called in re marriage cases, not in re gay marriage cases, not in re same-sex marriage cases, because what was being sought was the freedom to marry. It wasn't seeking some new kind of marriage. It was seeking marriage. Um, and that was what was provided. And as a result of it, thousands of joyous legal weddings of same-sex couples took place over a four and a half month period um, while opponents of the ruling waged the most expensive initiative campaign in US history, about $40 million on each side uh, spent battling this. Uh, and ultimately were able to secure passage of Proposition 8, which amended the California Constitution to again limit civil marriage in the state to a union between a man and a woman. Uh, in a case that followed, known as Strauss versus Horton, uh, Lambda Legal, the ACLU, and National Center for Lesbian Rights challenged Proposition 8 in state court, uh, arguing that it was invalidly adopted through the constitutional amendment process which requires only a majority vote in California of the, of, of, at a, a general election. Um, and that the impro proponents instead should have followed the, provision, the requirements for constitutional revisions, which would have required passage by two thirds of each house of the legislature uh, before going to the voters. Um, we argued that in writing inequality into the state constitution, Prop 8 was making such a fundamental change in the state's charter that it should be considered a revision of the Constitution, not just an amendment. And we argued that it was quite important that that be done because what Prop 8 did is actually amend the state's Equal Protection Clause and create an exception to equality, which means it created inequality. Um, and in fact, turned the Equal Protection Clause into an Unequal Protection Clause. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the state Supreme Court rejected that argument by a six to one vote and uh, upheld uh, the adoption of Prop 8 under the state constitution. And that's what led to the filing of, of the Perry case. Perry reflected a different strategy than prior cases uh, seeking the ability to enter same, civil marriages for same sex couples. All of the prior modern day marriage cases had been brought in state court. Uh, invoking only protections under state constitutions. Perry was filed in federal court claiming that not allowing same-sex couples to marry violates the US Constitution. This was a significant upping of the stakes. Um, while a victory in the Perry case uh, could result in same-sex couples being allowed to marry everywhere in the country, um, although the case might be decided more narrowly, a loss could have devastating consequences. It could foreclose not only future federal constitutional arguments about marriage for decades, which could affect state constitutional litigation as well, because many state uh, courts look to federal jurisprudence. Um, but it could result in rulings setting back gay people's rights on numerous fronts, including protections against other forms of discrimination and family law settings in general. For this reason, the national LGBT legal groups had deferred bringing federal cases challenging the denial of marriage equality. We were concerned about whether there was a, ma a majority on the US Supreme Court that was ready to overturn the marriage laws of 45 states. Um, that's kind of a big ask. And uh, we had seen what had happened when the Supreme Court was asked to overturn the sodomy laws of 24 states in the Bowers v. Hardwick case and how it took 17 years before the Supreme Court was ready to revisit the issue of such laws constitutionality in Lambda Legal's Lawrence v. Texas case, which in part we won uh, because at that point the number of states with sodomy laws had been reduced to 13 through state victories uh, in state courts and state legislatures. The Perry case was filed May 23, 2009 on behalf of two same-sex couples who wanted to marry by a newly formed group known as the American Foundation for Equal Rights which was headed by a public relations executive and financed by a small number of wealthy gay and heterosexual businessmen, mostly Hollywood producers and writers. Uh, in a brilliant PR move, they hired Ted Olson and David Boies, who had been opposing counsel in the Bush v. Gore case at the Supreme Court that had decided the 2000 election. 
um, and hired them to be the counsel in the case. And Olson was a former Republican Solicitor General, and uh, his leading the case, I think, has done a lot to upend the traditional opposition to gay people being able to marry among conservatives, um, and made this somewhat less of a partisan issue. Uh, and both he and boys are exceptional lawyers. Lambda Legal and our colleagues at our sister LGBT legal groups believe that if the case was going to go forward, its best chance of success was development of a factual record that would dispel many myths about gay people and prove that there was no legitimate reason to deny us the freedom to marry. The plaintiff's lawyers originally uh, opposed that idea, wanting to get the case to the US Supreme Court as quickly as possible. But the judge assigned to the case, Vaughn Walker, concluded that there would be a trial. We therefore work closely with the plaintiff's counsel, as we had had the experience of making factual presentations on these issues in uh, our 1985 trial in the Hawaii marriage litigation, in our uh, Iowa marriage case, in numerous parenting cases, and in the Romer v. Evans case, where Lambda Legal and the ACLU successfully challenged Colorado's Amendment 2, which had sought to preclude passage of and repeal uh, sexual orientation into discrimination laws in the state. Um, and so we worked with them in finding experts, uh, providing them depositions from uh, other cases, um, researching uh, the backgrounds of the supposed experts on the other side, uh, and uh, trying to make them aware of the arguments that our opponents ha have made and what sort of flaws were uh, underlying them. During a two-week trial, the plaintiffs put on evidence about the history of marriage, the nature of sexual orientation, the prevalence of discrimination against gay people, uh, a relative lack of political power, the psychological and economic impacts of being denied the ability to marry, and parenting by same-sex couples. In one of the many things that made the case unusual, the defendants in the case, the governor, the attorney general, state officials who administered the marriage licensing process, and two city clerks de declined to defend. Um, they said that they uh, either, according to the attorney general, believed that Proposition 8 violated the US Constitution, or the governor, uh, that this is something the court should decide, but he wasn't going to put on a defense. Um, the official proponents of the initiative, represented by the Alliance Defense Fund, an anti-gay nonprofit legal organization funded by right-wing religious groups, were allowed to def uh, intervene in the case to defend the measure. They put on only two witnesses, both of whom ended up actually supporting aspects of the plaintiff's case. Um, on August 4th, Federal District Court Judge Vaughn Walker held that Proposition 8 is unconstitutional, a ruling that it violated the federal constitution guarantees of due process, uh, an aspect of, of uh, liberty, um, and the constitutional right of equality. He disagreed with the proponents that uh, Prop 8 sought a new right of same-sex marriage and agreed that the plaintiffs that what was being sought was the same right to marry that the U.S. Constitution had already held in several cases involving interracial couples, uh, people in prison, uh, men who were delinquent in their child support, uh, had to marry. Um, he also ruled that Prop 8 discriminated both on the grounds of sexual orientation and sex, and that laws that discriminate on those grounds require the courts to strictly scrutinize their validity and must be necessary to further a compelling state interest. Um, and he concluded that based on the uh, evidence that was presented in 50 pages of findings of fact, uh, that there was not even a legitimate reason for denying same-sex couples the freedom to marry. Uh, he issued an injunction, and the defendants in the case, the state defendants, the government defendants, uh, uh, ordered them not to enforce Prop 8 and to allow same-sex couples to marry again in California. Um, but on August 16th, the Ninth Circuit stayed that. That is, they put it on hold pending resolution of the appeal. Uh, I wrote a friend at court brief in that case, along with the ACLU at the National Center for Lesbian Rights and Gay and Lesbian Advocates and Defenders, supporting the plaintiff's arguments that Prop 8 is unconstitutional, but making a narrower argument as well. Um, uh, one uh, that uh, because California uh, provides same-sex couples all of the rights and benefits of marriage through its domestic partnership and family laws, the only reason to deny them marriage is to express that same-sex couples' relationships are less valued and worthy than those of different sex couples. And in effect, to make uh, gay people second-class citizens of the country. And that constitutes, we argued, a per se violation of the Equal Protection Clause. It is simply 
a, a, an absolute denial of, in, in, of equality to say one group is going to be treated differently and worse because if anyone had the choice, they would choose to get marriage, which is, which is a preferred status socially and legally in the country. Um, and instead, uh, it, uh, gay people and gay people alone were being denied that. Now, if domestic partner status, status, uh, domestic partner status was available equally to same-sex and different-sex couples, it would be a harder case. Um, but here, uh, only marriage is available to uh, uh, same-sex to different-sex couples, and same-sex couples are relegated to this uh, new uh, and lesser status. Numerous other friends of the corpus were filed. One particularly important was submitted on behalf of a number of religious groups uh, supportive of marriage equality, including California Faith for Equality, California Council of Churches, the General Synod of the United Church of Christ, Universal Fellowship of the Metropolitan Community Churches, the Episcopal Bishops of California and Los Angeles, <laughs> the Progressive Jewish Alliance, Pacific Association of Reform Rabbis, and the Unitarian Universalist Association, arguing that Proposition 8 denies rather than protects religious liberty, and that anti-gay views of some, but certainly not all religions, cannot form a valid basis for upholding Prop 8. The uh, Ninth Circuit heard oral argument on December 6th, and one of the issues that got raised on appeal, since the government defendants had not appealed the ruling, um, was whether the proponents of Prop 8 had a right to do so. Federal courts have limited authority to consider cases, and one requirement is that the person who brings an appeal has to have suffered a direct and particularized interest in the judgment being appealed. And a challenge for the people who uh, uh, proposed Prop 8 um, is that they weren't ordered to do anything by the judge's ruling. And allowing same-sex couples to marry wasn't going to make it so that they couldn't get married. It wasn't like we are going to run out of marriage licenses in California. Um, and so uh, they actually have a hard hoe to row to show why should they get to appeal that judgment that doesn't directly impact them. Um, a prior case involving Arizona's English only law in which the Ninth Circuit had decided that initiative proponents have such an interest had gone up to the Supreme Court which unanimously had said it had grave doubts about the conclusion that initiative proponents have such a right. And in that case, they said, well, there wasn't even anything in state law that gave initiative proponents that authority. So on January 4th, the Ninth Circuit issued an order asking the California Supreme Court to tell it whether initiative proponents have a direct and particularized interest sufficient to have the right to defend initiatives when they're challenged and to step into the shoes of the government when it does not defend them. The new Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court has said that they will decide soon. Uh, whether or not they will answer the question posed by the Ninth Circuit, perhaps as soon as next week. The California court doesn't have to answer that question, uh, and it has denied requests from the Ninth Circuit to answer questions about California law at least 10 times over the last 11 years. Um, but if it does agree to answer that question, it'll order briefing and oral argument, uh, and then we'll have to decide, so we could be waiting quite a while before we even get an answer to that question. If the California Supreme Court agrees to answer the question and concludes that initiative proponents do have the authority to step into the state's shoes and appeal a ruling that the initiative violated the federal constitution when state officials do not appeal, I think it's very likely that the Ninth Circuit will dismiss the appeal um, because they'll be in a situation where even the state says they don't have that right. If that happens, Prop 8 would be struck down and same-sex couples would be able to marry again in California, but the case would have no direct impact on the laws of other states. Of course, the proponents would likely ask the Supreme Court to hear the matter, but then what would be before the Supreme Court is whether or not they had the ability to appeal, not the actual marriage issue. If the California Supreme Court concludes that the proponents do have a sufficiently direct uh, and particularized interest, um, then based on what the Ninth Circuit judges said in their order sending it to the California Supreme Court, I think it's likely they will find that the appeal can go forward, though they don't have to because it's an issue of federal law. Um, and then they'd have to go on to decide the merits of the case, which they could either decide broadly, um, based on the freedom to marry, uh, what is the contour of the right to marry under the Constitution, and on equal protection principles, or they could describe, to decide more narrowly on the argument that I was sketching out earlier. 
Um, whatever they do, that can then be appealed to the full Ninth Circuit uh, and uh, can be reheard before a panel of 11 judges instead of three. Um, and whatever happens then can go up to the U.S. Supreme Court. So we're in media res. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, meanwhile, while all that's going on, there are now five federal cases across the country challenging the so-called Federal Defense of Marriage Act. And there are many cases going on in state courts dealing with uh, marriage equality uh, issues and, and particularly issues affecting same-sex couples and their families. Um, I focus mostly on the legal issues leading up to and raised in the Perry case, but I want to close by saying two things that approach these issues from a somewhat different angle. First, I believe that the position of heterosexual opponents to marriage equality, that they should be able to deny to lesbians and gay men that which many of them cherish and have dreamed of since childhood, is a morally reprehensible position. According to virtually all religions and philosophies, whether it's referred to as the categorical imperative or described in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, or more commonly as the golden rule, that position violates the precept that you should do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It violates a basic notion that it's not OK to tell people that they have no right to have what you cherish. And at base, I believe it's a very selfish position. And I think that the people who are urging that need to be called out about it. Because what it's basically saying, you can't have what I treasure because, well, simply I don't want you to. Second, chief among the reasons advanced for the passage of Prop 8 was the proponent's warning that continuing to allow same-sex couples to marry, quote, would result in our public schools teaching that same-sex marriage is OK. But as Judge Walker concluded in the Perry case, the position that it's not OK is premised on a view that gay people are not OK and that our relationships are not OK, that they're less worthy. And I think that that's a position that most people, if they think about, understand, contributes to discrimination against gay people and contributes to the harassment and bullying of lesbian and gay youth that um, according to the press, led to at least eight young people in one month this fall hanging themselves, shooting themselves in the head, and jumping off a bridge to their death. That's what happens when laws, our laws express that gay people and our love and our dreams are to be condemned as inferior. So that's really what's at stake in this debate. Thank you. Thank you. A tough act to follow. <laughs> and Mr. A.V. Guy is moving. There's nothing on the screen. Oh, there we are. All right. Ta-da. Well, welcome. Uh, again, I'm Susan Russell from uh, All Saints Episcopal Church in California. And I'm going to um, throw this little bit up here just to, to get started. Um, First, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a native of California and a cradle Episcopalian, which means I've been one my whole life. Um, I was ordained in 1996, and I'm currently on staff at All Saints Church in Pasadena, where we've been blessing same-sex unions since 1992. So one of the things I live with in my context is when I, they say, where are you going now? And I say, I'm going to Nashville, to Vanderbilt, to talk about marriage equality, and they're like, again? Uh, <laughs> For many in my context, um, this is a battle that we should have won a long time ago, but Prop 8 was a great wake-up call um, for many of us. I'm also honored to be a founding member of the Human Rights Campaign Religion Council and was a spokesperson uh, for California Faith for Equality during the Prop 8 campaign. Um, and I was raised in a tradition which has a really strong theological foundation for social justice, which connects the dots between the gospel imperative and social action in our communities. And this is one of my favorite quotes from a presiding bishop of our National Episcopal Church back in the 60s. 
presiding Bishop John Hines famously said, justice is the corporate face of God's love. So in this about 10 minute uh, a presentation I want to make, I just want to name that. Um, for those of you who are here from the Divinity School, that's the theological construct that I approach, an integrated way of living out my life uh, in alignment with God's love and justice and compassion. And for those of you from the law school, which who may or may not know that there are people of faith who do this stuff, uh, there are, and I'm one of them. So welcome to my world. Uh, so my foundational theology and my lived experience agree. Faith voices are crucial in the marriage equality movement. And I can't even begin to tell you what an honor it is to be here today um, and to be part of what I think is really a groundbreaking opportunity to bring together spokespeople from these two, in some ways, different but related disciplines. Um, the fact that John and I are here together, part of the same movement, working together toward the same goal, and connecting the dots. We were talking, coming in in the car from the airport as well as at dinner last night, that he gets the Bible questions and I get the legal standing questions. And, you know, we're both, it, it's wonderful to be in the same room at the same time and be able to hand them off. So here's a little bit about what I learned, what we learned uh, in California during the Prop 8 campaign. Uh, this is a timeline of some of the Prop 8 stuff, but John just went through that whole timeline, so I'm not going to revisit it. But all of this suffice to say it's been a journey with some steps forward and some steps back. And as we're now waiting on rulings on Judge Walker's ruling, we're also still looking back at what we learned, uh, have learned during this campaign. Um, there was a very important gathering in California after Prop 8, and people, I mean, I was getting over, really, California? You're going to lose marriage for us? You know, what's up? You know, it's California, for God's sake. And, um, you know, sometimes I found myself saying, I have two words for you, Orange County, okay? I mean, you, um, we elected Arnold Schwarzenegger governor. You know, we don't have a, a, a blameless past. But I think... Um, I think it was a big wake-up call, um, certainly for ma many folks younger than me who grew up, you know, with Ellen and Modern Family and, you know, oh well, and they were like, what do you mean you can't take rights away? Well, they did. And we need to learn from that. Um, and here are some of the things we learned. There was a lot of work done to, done to debrief that campaign and find out what we did right and what we did wrong. And um, with an eye to some of the following moving forward. There were three things that were identified as the top three uh, lost opportunities. Sometimes we call them failings, but you know we try to be more proactive about our language. So let's call them lost opportunities. Um, clergy leaders identified as the most effective messengers for marriage equality were underutilized in the No and 8 campaign in California. And John is nodding his head. People of color are part of our LGBT family, and we must promote their leadership and inclusion to inform and direct outreach to their communities, another big miss for us. And the No on 8 ads lacked heart and inexcusably excluded same-sex couples and their families. It was all based on really bad polling data going in, and we could spend a lot of time talking about that, but that's not what this is about. But these were the identified three misses in California in the move for marriage equality in the Prop 8 case. And the number one, because I'm here to talk about where the faith component connects with the marriage equality movement, was that clergy leaders had been identified as the most effective messengers for marriage equality, and they were underutilized. And we were ready. We were there. We were deployed. We were messaged. We had our signs. Look at us. Aren't we fabulous? <laughs> Rabbis, priests, deacons, bishops even, standing around, all dressed up and no place to go. It was, uh, it was a sad thing in many ways. And it was also a galvanizing opportunity for many in our community to build coalitions across differences, to talk and understand um, how we are and who we are. Which leads me to my apples and oranges argument, which is one of my favorites. Um, we're all in this together, those of us who believe that, in my tradition, we have something called a baptismal covenant. And we promise to respect the dignity of every human being. And, as a proud American, we got this Pledge of Allegiance, which on the same way, we talk about liberty and justice for all. Now, you can't respect the dignity of every human being 
and exclude some of them from some equal protection or blessings within your church. And you can't have liberty and justice for all. There's no invisible asterisk that says unless you happen to be a gay person who wants equal protection for your family. But they're in some ways discrete, but different, interlocking, but discreetly different arguments. And the theological argument and the political argument need to be made equally and balanced, but they need to be made in their context. So when I turn on, used to be Larry King Live, and I see, used to be Jerry Falwell, holding forth about the sanctity of marriage, and some really nice, earnest, well-meaning, really well-informed ACLU lawyer talking in the other box, they're talking past each other. Um, we need to have these debates and have these discussions in ways that we can really talk to each other. And it isn't by having uninformed faith leaders out there seceding our arguments and our theological um, foundations to others. We need to know our history. We need to know our traditions. We need to know our gospel or our Torah. And we need to be able to live that out into the world. And I think we're getting there. And this is the other side of the apples and oranges argument that just is an example that happened this week in my tradition. Holy matrimony is to civil marriage what an apple is to an orange. Okay? They make a great fruit salad mixed up together, but they're very different things. And we confuse them. We confuse them to our detriment. Just this week in Rhode Island, which is uh, on the uh, cutting edge now, um, another one of the um, battleground states, here's a statement that was issued by the Episcopal Bishop of Rhode Island, who is arguably more conservative than I am. <laughs> it's probably stating it a little lightly, but... Uh, Bishop Wolf said, as the Episcopal Bishop of the Diocese of Rhode Island, I firmly support the traditional definition of marriage as the union between one male and one female. I believe that holy matrimony is a sacred religious right whose definition should not be reinterpreted by the legislation or civil courts. So again, I have two words for her, First Amendment, okay? The courts and the legislation can't reinterpret for her what she believes holy matrimony means. So she gets it right in that she says the state should be not be messing with holy matrimony. What she gets wrong is that the church should not be messing with equal protection. Now here's the second half of her statement. And I wish I knew who her advisors were because they, they did, were not earning their money last week. <clears throat> this is her recommendation to Rhode Island. Legislators could honor the civil rights of all individuals by eliminating the term marriage and substituting the term civil unions. Now she's talking to the legislators here. Religious organizations could then make their own decisions as regards the recognition or non-recognition of their unions. Which of course we can already do because First Amendment. So the bishop, in a misguided attempt to protect the already protected by the First Amendment right to define holy matrimony, would take away from all Rhode Island families the protections given by federal marriage rights. The mind boggles. But the problem is, as ludicrous as that argument can be, and we could sit here and unpack it, they work. And we found that in California. Political arguments that allowing same-sex marriages violates the sanctity of marriage and would force churches to do something contrary to their teaching or conscience are blatantly misleading and dishonest. And as John alluded to, they work. An example from the California campaign is this poster um, all over the restoring marriage and protecting California children. Well, who doesn't want to protect children? And this was never about protecting children. It's about perpetuating discrimination. But they framed the argument this way. And as a result, we found ourselves having to play catch up the whole time. And we didn't quite catch up. But here's the good news. Uh, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's in the Bible. <laughs> <clears throat> the truth is, marriage equality merely guarantees equality under the law to all citizens. It does not compel any churches to do anything. The fact that the state authorizes marriage does not compel anyone to uh, preside or recognize it. And as it notes up here, Roman Catholics routinely demonstrate that liberty when they refuse to perform marriages for divorced persons. 
Um, Orthodox rabbis exercise the same freedom when they decline to preside at an interfaith wedding. The idea, the, the, the mistruth, the spin, that somehow people of faith are going to be forced to do something against their conscience is just blatantly false. And that's the language we need to get out there in order to rebut those arguments. Because there are a lot of good people of goodwill and deep faith and kind hearts who aren't sure they think gay people should marry, but maybe it would be okay. But they sure don't want to force the pastor down the street to do something against their conscience. So you can see how the, the challenge is to try to um, get those questions apart. So our task here today is to talk about how we influence, how activists influence uh, the move toward marriage equality. The best voices to speak that truth are faith leaders who are putting their faith into action by speaking from their own pastoral experience. Um, and that's what I'm here to represent today, to say that there are people in the movement, in the congregations, in the churches, in this country who want to have a voice, who want to offer a voice, who want to serve in partnership with John and Lambda Legal and Human Rights Campaign and others, uh, to be able to neutralize the voices from, uh, for lack of better stereotype, the religious right, um, and to be able to say, you know, we're people of faith too. And where my faith is calling me to is to stand in solidarity with those who are oppressed and marginalized, and in this case, to stand for marriage equality. So that's my first 10 minutes. The second 10 minutes, I want to share with you a brief video that we made a um, couple of months ago. Uh, Human Rights came, Pain helped put it together, but it was designed to, to uh, present to faith leaders to convince them to come, to come out to um, come out of um, apathy and come out of complacency and come out of anxiety and to put their faith into action by speaking out for marriage equality. Um, and um, I love the diversity that's represented in this. And um, it's supposed to work if I push this, right? The churches that are really growing in this country are those that have embraced LGBT equality and are working for it and giving people a model for community that is about mutual love and respect. We've been heartened lately uh, by two new uh, polls that have been done, one of mainline Protestant clergy that says that uh, two-thirds of those clergy are just waiting on their parishioners to um, get ready to hear the message that LGBT people are loved of God and deserve full marriage equality rights. Uh, the other poll showed that two-thirds of their parishioners are sitting in the pew each Sunday thinking, I just wish this guy would give some leadership on this issue. I'm ready to go. There's a whole world that is waiting for people of faith to act in a just and public way. There are people who are waiting to hear their own voices echoed, their feelings, their deep thoughts heard and articulated from the pulpit and from people of faith. Putting faith into action means living out one's theology and spirituality as you help to transform the world. At least for me, uh, Jewish tradition teaches that we must participate in uh, the ideal of tikkun olam, which means to repair or heal the world. 
those of us in the Abrahamic faiths, in, in Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, we have a prophetic tradition which says, uh, and I'll quote, I'll quote Hebrew scripture, Micah 6, 8, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? Do, love, and act. Those are verbs, those are action-based, and those are pro that's prophetic language. One of the most amazing uh, examples uh, comes from the 20th century. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel was one of uh, the great uh, contemporary theologians of the late 20th century. He marched with M Dr. Martin Luther King and was one of the first rabbis to do so. Heschel was the white man with the prophet's beard, two to the right of Dr. King. That was the occasion on which Heschel said he felt he was praying with his legs. And that is the motto of putting faith into action. That it's not just about book learning, it's not just about theology, it's about taking action and being part of a movement of transformation. Dr. King, if he were alive today, would be on the side of justice. He would be on the side of LGBT justice and advocating for marriage equality as a civil right that all should enjoy. If we look at the civil rights movement carefully, so much of the momentum that sustained that movement was the momentum of letting God's justice come to the counter, to the schoolhouse, into the center of society. That was people trying to put justice to work that, that Amos talks about, that Isaiah talks about, that Jesus talks about. Doing this work and, and being active on the, on the issue of marriage equality has deepened my faith. It has deepened my spiritual commitment to my community. It has made me want to be active in more ways. It has made me want to be a, a better Christian. It has made me want to do more service. I need to tell you that my life was transformed as a result of doing same-sex marriages here. My name is Father Jeffrey Farrell. I was um, born in Cuba. I was ordained a Catholic priest for service to the people of the Diocese of Fresno. And my parishioners asked me to make a statement of clarification on Proposition 8 uh, because the diocese was promoting the yes on 8 position and they were divided over this. And on the 5th of October, I made a statement in which I explained why personally I felt morally compelled to vote no on Proposition 8. This is not an issue we choose, this is an issue that chooses us. There is not a family on earth that doesn't have a member who's lesbian or gay. When clergy step up and say, I am here on, you know, stand with my brothers and sisters, with my friends and neighbors, when I stand with the human family for equality because I believe that God has called us all to that, because I believe that equality is a part of God's will for everyone. That is very, very powerful. Clergy shrinking back away from equality for all is a devastating blow to equality. I began to take my role as a pastor more seriously uh, when a parishioner came to me after service one Sunday morning and said at the door, Pastor, that was a very nice sermon today, but I don't need a nice sermon. And if you're only going to preach nice sermons, I will go to another church because I need to be challenged. I need a pastor who is going to challenge me to be more socially active, a person who connects the front pages of the newspaper with the social gospel. He said, if you can't do that, I'll find a pastor who can. So I was pushed by a parishioner to move out of the safety and sanctity and serenity of the sanctuary into the streets and to begin from the pulpit, but also to take the stories in the Bible and apply them to everyday life. My daughter's best friend at school, that little girl has two moms. And during Prop 8, my daughter said to me, I'm worried about Bella's family. And that's the kind of empathy that I want my children to have. I want them to be thinking about the impact of all these political abstractions swirling around us, we have to remember that they impact individual people's lives. The point of my activism is to bring 
Christ's love into the public sphere, to bring the values of empathy and compassion and responsibility for each other, to bring that front and center, both in my personal life and in, our, in my public life. And I want them to be able to model that themselves. There are many ways that people can put their faith into action around marriage equality, including doing outreach and dialogue with others of their own faith tradition who might differ on the notion of marriage equality, learning about one another, learning why your faith calls you to work for marriage equality for people who are on the other side, as well as to hear their concerns, is a very important, important part of this marriage equality battle. I have determined that in order for me to have full integrity in standing with persons who love each other and have been denied the legal right to marry, I will not perform any marriage ceremony until that right is granted to all persons. We have dozens of people who have come here, joined the church, and are now very healthy, active, engaged, committed members, pledging, tithing, working all, the, all across the spectrum of our work. They came here because we took a strong social justice stand on equality, on marriage equality, and because they know that we've been blessing unions for decades and that we're not about to back away from that and we want, it, we want to move it to the next level of civil, of civil equality in terms of marriage. We have lots of people, not only gay people, but we have people whose family members are gay and lesbian. We have people whose children are gay and lesbian. We have people whose friends and um, siblings are gay and lesbian who are straight themselves, who came because they want to be a part of a community that, that stands up for justice for all people, that proclaims marriage equality as a part of God's agenda for the human family. And they come and they stay and they work. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing experience. We are called upon to be an image of God. You see, God is absent, invisible. And the task of a human being is to represent the divine to be a reminder of the presence of God. Once we become committed to becoming the face and hands of God to people, God provides that experience every single day, the opportunity every single day to be the face and hands of God to people who are in trouble or lost or excluded or suffering in any way. If we follow the guiding principle of Dr. King that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, it mandates that we speak out on behalf of the LGBT community. To our faith leaders, I must request, in fact demand, that we use our faith to affirm the dignity of all of humanity and not to oppress. This country has seen this go on for far too long. And if we do not pursue justice for the LGBT community, then we will not have justice for any community. All right, and there you have it. And I do want to note that it was produced by my fabulous wife, who's an amazing um, videographer. Um, I'm going to just say two more sentences, and then we're going to move to our conversation. It is such an honor to be here, and I could not um, imagine being here without bringing this witness with me, because um, I stand on the shoulders of those and generations before me and before us who have stood up and spoken out and been willing to lobby and put their faith into action. And um, what I guess the one message I want to make sure gets heard is that there are people of faith out there who are ready, willing, and able to be deployed in this great work. And I couldn't think of better partners to have than Lambda Legal and the others. So uh, thank you for having me the opportunity to be here. And now I think we want to hear from you. First, I want to make sure you can hear me. Everybody in the back, too? Uh, we'll do a, make sure that that's the case for all of us um, as we say our first words. Um, I want to, um, I want to uh, thank our 
our panelists, our two presenters, for two really, really wonderful presentations. And I'm going to start um, with just a couple of an observation and then a question. Um, my observation is it's um, it's really interesting to hear um, that we've had we really have had two very different presentations. And on the one hand, from John, we got really nitty-gritty legal, you know, I mean, really, here's how the cases have gone, here are the grounds of the arguments. I mean, this, the, and, and it's on that basis, you know, that really, so that these issues are going to be eventually legally resolved. There's mm -hmm. no question about it. But that's a different register in a certain way. And then from Susan, we heard um, more, at first at the beginning, some concrete things. Here's some observations about what went wrong in the, um, in the, in the anti-Prop 8 campaign. And then very idealistic, in some ways, kind of language. And much more, again, a different register. And one, the register that is going to, I think, that's attempting to persuade hearts and minds, in your case. And not that hearts and minds aren't an issue in the legal case, too. But in certain ways, it's, 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 really, it's really kind of down and dirty, in some ways. Um, very nitty gritty kinds of things that one has to that one has to consider there, and of course at the end of John's even there again we heard more on the um, on that register. So that's just an observation. I wonder if that's um, if how the how that difference in registers and difference in modes of argumentation and maybe in certain respects in um, in goals both enables and perhaps gets in the way of working across um, the or working across coalitions, I guess, or forming coalitions between religious um, leaders, faith leaders, and, um, and legal activists. And my question is really, if that's not it, what, what happened in California that, um, that, that religious leaders were underutilized? Well, that's a, a several different questions. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, so I guess I would say one of the things I think we struggle with in our work in courts is it is important to engage people's hearts as well as their minds. And we try to do a lot of storytelling in our litigation um, to have, to feature real people, um, to humanize this to the courts and have them understand the consequences of not allowing same-sex couples to marry. Um, but we do it within a framework of um, legal principles. Um, and so it's partially sometimes I feel like trying to make the courts want to rule for you, and then trying to find a way uh, to use uh, the existing doctrine to make it possible for them to rule for you. Um, but it's a challenge, and I think uh, that you're right that, that um, some of, you know, when you get into a doctrine about uh, standing, uh, which is a lot of what the fight has been about, it, it's hard to pitch it in a way that, that it doesn't get tied up in civil procedure issues. The case has been a wonderful lesson for the country, I think, in, um, in kind of what actually goes on in courts. And I fear that it's deterring a lot of people from joining law schools. But, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, you know, I, I do think uh, that it is, um, moving to your other question, uh, challenging about si since we have a separation of church and state, of how to introduce uh, the religious voices into the legal proceedings. Um, and there have been important voices in the amicus briefs, but the friend of the court briefs, but principally to rebut the religious arguments made on the other side. Um, because we're talking about the civil institution of marriage, um, it kind of, the fact that some religions may embrace same-sex couples um, is not as central other than to note that um, you can't uh, base your decisions based on some religious group's opposition because then you'll be preferring one religion over another, which is not allowed. So, uh, Jumping to the third question about what happened in the campaign, I must say, I wasn't responsible for the campaign. Uh, <laughs> um, I, um, I think it's really hard uh, when 
for the people running these campaigns, I, I've seen it in, in state after state where they've happened that um, people very much want to win and they, I think, rely too heavily on um, political advisors who, um, who don't really play enough to the heart in the way that the campaigns are waged. Um, and I do think that's part of why they, they, they ceded too much ground to the other side's emotional appeals. Um, and I think there are very emotional appeals that can be made about same-sex couples and their kids and how they are being hurt by not being allowed to marry. I'd also jump in with just one thing. Um, I think we also had some really bad polling data going in. And from my perspective, knowing what I know, that when you have people doing focus groups and asking faith-based questions, of people of faith, but the people asking those questions are not coming from a faith tradition. You're not going to get good data because they're asking questions that I can see the answers they're getting aren't giving them anything helpful about what would work. And one of the things we have to realize is, we're particularly within the gay and lesbian community, the church has done a lot of damage over the years. We've got a lot of whopping wounded out there who've internalized homophobia, want nothing to do with religion. <laughs> So in some ways, some of us are still trying to, you know, build some of those bridges back and say, wait a minute, you know, we're here, we can help. We want to be part of the solution. We aren't the problem. And I think uh, we're making progress. Um, human rights campaign within the last five years added a faith and religion council. Who would ever thought that would happen? Um, <laughs> and we're doing some great work together. So again, I think it's about modeling. I think it has to be a both ends. Very quick story, which I told at lunch. I grew up in the Episcopal Church. When I started out as a little person, we didn't have women priests, okay? They came along in 1976. Our convention passed a resolution that allowed women priests. As a young woman, I thought that was great, but for me personally, when I wanted a priest, I wanted a real one. I wanted a father, because that was all I'd ever known, okay? <laughs> it wasn't until I met a woman in that role that my heart and mind was changed. But if the legislation hadn't happened, I'd have never met her. So it's got to be the both of them. We have lots of work to do with changing hearts and minds and teaching in all of our different contexts. But at the same time, if that legislation isn't happening that's pushing us forward, it has to be a both of them. And I think part of what went on in the campaign, I think, was a lot of fear on the part of the people running it. That if they showed images of gay people, because this is what some of the focus groups said, people will react negatively. And I think what they didn't get is, well, that might be an initial thing, but unless you really engage people about that, they're going to react negatively when it comes to casting their vote. And then my follow-up question, and then I'm going to open it up to the rest of you, it has to do with, um, with the hearts and minds kinds of questions. Could you both reflect on what you think um, are maybe the 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 bigger issues. Where what is the resistance really about? Um, and or, and the other way of phrasing that would be: What are the arguments that seem to work um, in persuading people? Theological arguments, legal arguments, you know, arguments based on, you know, American heritage, all of any of any and all of that. Um, my partner did a lot of um, the canvassing, um, both during the campaign and, and after, to. Um, uh, going knocking doors and asking people what, what they think and trying to engage them about it. And there were a number of different things that I think were going on. Some was, was as Susan was describing, people who just believed things that were not true. They said, I don't want this because my church will lose its tax-exempt status. It was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but they had been told that and uh, at, uh, by some of their, their uh, ministers and pastors, and, and um, it, it was just fundamentally untrue. Uh, churches that would not perform other marriages did not lose their tax-exempt statuses. Um, they were told, uh, some of them believed that, um, uh, that they said, no, I've been taught that marriage is between a man and a woman. And that was the end of it. And part of it was like trying to get beyond that and say, OK, well, we understand that's what you believe. But what about the people who believe something different? Um, how will it affect your belief? What, how will you be hurt? And if, if you can't identify something, 
what about then trying to tell the stories of a couple who um, one was not allowed to visit the other in the hospital, to make medical decisions for them, to, um, uh, uh, to decide whether what sort of uh, 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 funeral service there should be, um, telling real stories of what has happened to people, and also a lot of the discussion then came down to children, a concern about children. And we tried to press people on, well, what, what is it that you're worried about children? Well, I think some of the was still a fear like, well, if my children see same-sex couples getting married, then that might affect them and maybe they'll turn out lesbian or gay. <laughs> and trying to get to people like, first of all, most lesbian and gay people saw lots of heterosexuals growing up. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't work, work that, that way. way. <laughs> um, and, um, but also I always felt like, wait, do you think it's just like so enticing that if people just hear about it, they'll go like, oh, that's for me. I just, <laughs> I just didn't know it existed. Um, but but um, so part of it is just like really trying to engage the people about it. But, but also it's like, part of it I want to say like, and what would be so horrible? But, um, <laughs> but I, I do think it's, it, the, the, the thing to even get beyond that is, and do you think that they're not hearing about it now? It's like the issue is not going away. The kids are not ostriches. It's on TV. It's in music. It's on the, uh, the internet. It's, it's in the newspapers every day. Um, and so do you think your kids are not already hearing about it? So, um, but, but I think it's just a basic discomfort and fear. And, and for some people, I think it is a deeply held religious view, but what, what you, one needs to then engage on is, well, other people have different religious views. Whose religious view do you think gets to control in this country? Why is it yours as opposed to someone else's? And I think control is exactly it. I mean, my shorthand response to what, what it's, it's the death rattle of the patriarchy. We're talking about interlocking oppression. We're talking about the last gasp of white male privilege. And some of my best friends are white men. Some of them are in the house. Some of them are even straight. And uh, <laughs> but to, to that unexamined privilege that somehow I'm entitled. I mean, you should the comments I get on my blog sometimes that I leave up for others who don't get it to say, look at what we're up against. I mean, it's just that unexamined privilege that somehow you're entitled to define my family, to talk about what I'm entitled to have. And I think in terms of what's efficacious, the thing that I think is the most helpful is to continue to return to that apples and oranges thing. And I will say when I'm doing faith panels, I will defend to my last breath Rick Warren's right to think that marriage is only between a man and a woman, and that is absolutely his right and in some ways his responsibility because that's the core of his faith. At the same time, I will defend to my, will resist to my last breath and email and email blast and tweet and <laughs> blog and whatever, the right, he cannot write his theology into our Constitution. And that's what this is about. Who, and it, that's another argument sometimes when I'm talking with folks, you know, bless their, you know, we're a country of freedom of religion. There are people who believe in Sharia marriage. Now, how would you like it if a 52% majority in California decided to write that into our Constitution? How would that be working for you? I don't like that one so much. <laughs> So I think, again, separating the fact that you, you're absolutely right. We need to protect the sanctity of marriage and the right of every faith tradition to make up their own mind about what they're going to bless and how they're going to do that. And at the same time, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance we make doesn't have an asterisk that says, unless you're gay or lesbian. And that's what we're working to preserve in this country right now. All right, let's see. What kinds of questions have come up for folks in the audience? Uh, sure. Uh, so as I said, I, th I think I said there, there are five cases currently going on right now challenging the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, all in states where same-sex couples can currently legally marry um, or where marriages uh, entered in other states are recognized in the state. 
Um, one case that was brought in Massachusetts called Gill versus Office of Personnel Management uh, resulted in a ruling from federal district court uh, that the Federal Defense of Marriage Act is unconstitutional, that it violates principles of equal protection. Because what it does is when it says uh, a, a state allows marriages of both same-sex and different-sex couples, but the federal government says some of those marriages will treat as marriages and some of them will ignore. Um, it's treating uh, people, all of whom are married under state law, differently from one another based on whether or not it was a same-sex marriage or a different-sex marriage. Um, that's currently up on appeal to the First Circuit. Um, and uh, the briefing is currently underway. I've been working every night the last week uh, <laughs> on a friend of the court brief in that, in that case. Um, and uh, there was a companion case that was brought by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts suing the federal government, saying it violates our state's rights, um, uh, it violates principles of federalism for you to essentially co-opt us and force us because of some joint federal state programs like Medicaid to treat people differently in our state, even though we want to treat them all the same. Um, and uh, the judge agreed with that as well on kind of Tenth Amendment grounds. Um, so, uh, you know, the basic, the basic arguments in those cases, they're not really this, they don't have the freedom to marry argument, the kind of due process liberty right, um, because the couples are already married. Um, they've principally been based on, on an issue of equal protection and, and, uh, and a somewhat uh, fine-tuned equal protection argument that, uh, regardless of whether a state has to allow same-sex couples to marry, if it does, there's no f legitimate federal interest in not honoring those marriages. And it builds particularly on the history in this country of the federal government having, at all times leading up till now, uh, uh, with, with one small exception, um, recognized and honored marriages of same-sex couples. And this exception was with respect to polygamy, um, where the condition of Utah entering the union was that it outlaw polygamy. And the federal government, well, because no state currently allows plural marriages, uh, the federal government won't recognize them either. But um, the, uh, you know, people frequently say, well, what about that? What about what you're saying about, you know, uh, we shouldn't privilege one religion's views over another? Why, why what about? Me. And I think each thing needs to be judged on its own merits. The, the issues that arise with polygamy are different issues. Um, and partially, they arise with a history of the way in which, at least um, uh, in, in um, the situation of a, a man with multiple wives, how that has played out in this country of, uh, as abusive to women, um, and, uh, uh, and the way in which our marriage laws functionally are premised on uh, a couple um, and how they they could be done differently they're done differently in some other countries but in in this country actually husbands and wives are no longer treated differently from one another under our marriage laws and so it doesn't require functionally that there be a male and a female um, but it does require that there be two at the moment because if you imagine somebody that's in the hospital and the spouse needs to make a decision about certain medical care and there are two spouses and they're disagreeing, what would you do? Stay out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions?
Um, one thing is, and, and I, you know, that is a proposal that's been made by a number of people. Um, and the problem is, first of all, it would only work if that happened nationwide. Um, we'd have to change, you know, kind of nationwide decide we no longer have civil marriages. And, and so there's a legal problem with that in that there are a number of U.S. Supreme Court decisions saying that under our Constitution, there is a federal constitutional right to marry. So it's not quite clear that states could decide we're no longer going to have marriage. Now, the court could decide, well, by that we didn't necessarily mean the having the name of marriage. Um, but one of the things that we've seen in all this litigation is it's pretty hard to divorce the word um, from what it means to people. The word um, and the history and the symbolism about it is significant. That's why people are fighting about it. <laughs> it's not like it doesn't matter to people. It matters a lot to both sides. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the problems is I think, um, it, it, well two problems. One is what about the people who are not part of a faith community? who want to get married. They want the symbolism of what it means, and they want the history, and they want to partake of that, and they want the social significance of it. Um, and I, just to one example, I, I was at a lot of weddings between uh, June and, and November of 2008. And um, boy, uh, the, the stores did really well on wedding gifts <laughs> that, that couple months. Um, but. Uh, one of the things that struck me particularly was not only hearing from couples who, who'd gotten married, how even though they'd been together for 20 years, 30 years, it somehow just felt different the next day. <coughs> um, and, uh, but it was not just them, it was from their family members. The number of people who, who afterwards, it was, it was somebody, a parent of one of them, who came to me <coughs> afterwards and said, I want to thank you for the work you did. I now have a son-in-law. Now, this was somebody you know, where they'd accepted that person in their, as, as their child's partner for years. But it meant something different to them, that it was a son-in-law. And the problem is, I guess, theoretically, one could make this change in our society. It would take a long time. Because I don't think most heterosexuals would be willing to give up marriage. Even if there was a sense, well, we're married in my church, so I could say marriage. I think the other people who are not married in their church or synagogue or mosque would, would still want to be able to say, I'm married. Yeah, and I'm torn. I'm sort of, the, as the Bishop of Rhode Island was the woman who had that statement. And, you know, in, in defense of marriage, she's going to get rid of it altogether. I mean, it, it's just in order to keep gay and lesbian people from having equal status. Uh, and then, of course, we all get, well, you know, marriage is historically biblical marriage is between one man and one woman and is a sacrament of the church. Well, you know, except for a lot of exceptions in the Bible and except for the actual history of the church when <laughs> marriage didn't become a sacrament until like the 13th century. And, or as one of my friends, a bishop in Massachusetts said, originally, bishop, originally marriage was same-sex contract between two men because a man sold his daughter to her husband. So it was a contract between... <laughs> met people of the same sex, two men. So you know, what are we fighting about here? Right. So again, knowing our history um, and being able to say marriage has always been an evolution. And the more important question is, in this time, in this place, do we want to be a country where we do not give equal protection to all our families? We need, we're, we're seeing a shift in messaging and understanding from a rights, what they call a rights frame to a values frame. And the language is about family values. And I'm all for family values. I have a family that has values. But I think <laughs> we have to value all families. And in my context, some of those families have two moms and some of them have two dads. But they all have the love and the commitment that we need to focus on. And those are the stories we need to tell. I just add one thing. I, I, I guess I really get troubled by uh, the statement, again, you know, well, the Bible tells me it's uh, marriage is between a man and a woman. And I say, but what about all these passages where it was between a man and a woman and a woman and a woman and a woman and a woman? Yeah, you know, it's like, huh? And they say, well, each of those was between a man and a woman. And it's like, it's like, I'm sorry, there are like too many footnotes in your argument. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm going to the Bible 
to get, the Bible's a faith document. Going to the Bible to get answers about human sexuality makes as much sense as it did to go to the Bible to get answers about astronomy. It turned out that didn't work out for so good for Galileo because actually the earth does revolve around the sun, not the other way around. You know, I think if you look at most legal change in um, our country, it's a dynamic process. It, it's actually an interplay between what happens in the courts and what happens in our other branches of government. Um, and, um, you know, we, we um, I think most people feel like, well, if it passes through the political branches, it's somehow more legitimate. Um, the people wanted it. But we have a constitution, and our constitution was adopted in order to put brakes or controls on what the majority wants. That's why it's there. Otherwise, we would just have people vote on everything. Um, and whatever a majority decides, either direct democracy or representative democracy, that's what controls. We don't have that in this country. We have a constitutional democracy. And it says that as to certain fundamental rights, certain constitutionally protected rights, um, and as to the principle of equality, which pervades the Constitution, but is specifically in the 14th Amendment, the people don't have the final say on that. And that was something the people decided originally. They didn't trust themselves, or they didn't trust the leaders. And they wanted to say, no, there are some things that cannot be done. Um, and so there's nothing illegitimate with having the courts enforce that. Um, in fact, it's a really wonderful thing about this country that even though some people didn't want it, a lot of people didn't want it, we said that our schools could no longer be segregated. And even though a lot of people didn't like it, we said that women had a right to control their own bodies. Um, and I, you know, yes, those were controversial decisions, and partially because the courts decided them, it, you know, engendered ongoing political struggle. But I think that political struggle would have been there anyway, <laughs> um, because a lot of people feel strongly about those issues, and we're not going to change them regardless. And one of the things we've seen is that even in the states where there has been a political resolution, like New Hampshire, where marriage was adopted by a vote of the legislature, there's an effort by the opponents to now amend the state constitution in New Hampshire to overturn what the legislature did. So it's not like getting it done in the political process necessarily precludes an end to the debate. And in California, our legislature actually twice passed marriage equality, and Governor Schwarzenegger, of blessed memory, vetoed it twice. <laughs> so, you know, the fact that he's not defending this case, he's, he's still not made up for that. But I think just for me, the bottom line is it's just there's something fundamentally wrong with putting up to a majority vote fundamental rights. It's just wrong. I might take one more question, and then, oh, dear, we have competition. I guess we'll start over here. Well, there's definitely some arguments for recognition of marriage across state lines, and we've actually secured that in three states now. Um, in New York and in Maryland and New Mexico, uh, there is a, a, either a court rulings or attorney general opinions that the marriages need to be respected across state lines, but it's under what's called comedy principles, um, kind of a general obligation of states to honor what happens in other states. There's a big debate about whether the full faith and credit clause of the U.S. Constitution requires uh, one state to honor another state's marriages. There actually was not much litigation over this issue 
um, in other contexts in the past. There were a number of cases where different states had different laws about interracial marriages, um, and most of them ended up getting resolved on comedy grounds, uh, and full faith and credit wasn't actually litigated in, in those cases. Part of the problem is the full faith and credit clause talks about um, uh, uh, one state having to on, um, give, give full faith and credit to the judgments, records, and acts of other states, and it's not clear that a marriage qualifies as any of those things. So um, we, we even like pushed that really as an argument to make, um, and, and rather, uh, you know, I think the strongest arguments to make are ones having to do with equality uh, and, and individual liberty. First of all, we want to just thank um, John and Susan and Ellen for being here and for participating in what I thought was a great event um, this afternoon. So again, uh, thank you so much. Um, quickly to introduce um, us, the two of us standing here in front of you right now. Um, I'm Mitchell Ronigan. Um, I'm a 3L here at the law school and the president of Owl Law. Um, and this is Chris McCain, who is a second year divinity student and a co-chair of the Gable Group at the Divinity School, which is the sort of LGBTQI and ally group at the Divinity School. Um, one more round of thank yous. Um, to the Hyatt Fund here at the law school, again, to the Stonewall Bar Association um, of Nashville, and to the Carpenter Program at the Divinity School, um, all of whom provided the funding that made this possible. And so um, none of us would be here without that. And so we are, we are much indebted um, to you all for that. Thank you. And as uh, Dean Guthrie mentioned when he introduced the speakers before, uh, this is the first of a two-part series of discussions on gay marriage. The second part of this series will be on Wednesday, February 23rd at noon back in this room. Uh, and uh, instead of having outside guests come and speak about their work around uh, marriage equality, we're having scholars here from Vanderbilt's law and divinity schools talk about some of the, the questions that are undergirding uh, the, um, the work for marriage equality and questions that may not be um, always considered and out in the forefront. Um, the panel will be moderated by Kathleen Flake, professor of American religious history at the Divinity School, um, who also has a legal background. And then from the, the law school and Divinity Schools, we'll have um, from the Divinity School, Melissa Snar, an ethicist, and uh, again, a reprise of Ellen Armour. Um, <laughs> and then from the law school, we'll have Terry Maroney and Abby Rubenfeld. Um, so we hope that that will be a, a really interesting conversation that can um, explore these issues yet again from a different angle. Um, so that's on uh, Wednesday, February 23rd, right back in this room. And just as an added enticement, we'll have, um, we'll have pizzas and sodas available. So come hungry. Um, and uh, speaking of food, um, we also are very pleased to invite you to a reception just right outside um, where you can continue this conversation with your peers and also with John and Susan. Um, we invite you just to uh, linger around for a bit and enjoy um, the refreshments. And um, also, as John mentioned when he started, I wanted to remind you that he has brought some resources that are available for you to pick up on your way out if you're interested. And also, um, especially for law students, if you're interested in being on the email list that he mentioned, please sign up on your way out. So uh, just as we leave, let's give one more round of applause to our panelists.